It's Friday! I don't want to torture you with another week of our horrible dancing to Rebecca Black. Instead, let me know down in the comments what your Friday ritual to prepare for the weekend is. Most creative weekly escapade that you embark upon wins 700 internet points for me, redeemable only when the channel shuts down. Now before we get to the news today, we need a quick jingle update. Reese, what do you have for the jingle? It's jingle time. What do you got? God, get out of here! No! Bad Reese. Bad. Speaking of horrifying, let's get into today's hot news. Not that hot news is horrifying, just that we've got some real Debbie Downers to address today. It's not all bad news, but I'd rather lead with the crap and serve you up enjoyment at the end so we can leave this week on a positive note. So firstly, in the less crappy but still bad situation, it appears that all 50 US states will have to start paying sales tax on online purchases. Typically, one would only pay tax if the retailer had a physical presence in the state you were residing in when you made the purchase. Like how my Amazon bill suddenly went up once they opened their distribution center in Lakeland. However, there was a recent Supreme Court ruling issued in the case of South Dakota versus Wayfair, where the Supreme Court sided with the state that no one lives in or cares about with regards to collecting sales tax. The state that doesn't exist except for Mount Rushmore has a law in their books saying that online retailers must pay sales tax as if they had a physical presence in the middle of nowhere. The Supreme Court upheld that law in a vote of five to four, and it seems that this could set the very precedent for every state in the union to adopt this policy. There's no indication that you'll be paying more immediately. Every state would have to adopt this, but it's the government. So of course they're going to impose this new tax wording so they can recklessly spend it on roads, schools, and the occasional lavish limo ride to their daughter's sweet 16. But speaking of money making governments, let's talk about the worst story we have for you today. It appears the EU is moving forward on their stricter copyright laws. In a vote of 15 to 10, the Parliament's Committee of Legal Affairs has approved Article 13, which imposes stricter regulations on user-generated content that could potentially use someone else's copywritten material. In case you're wondering, that means the EU is banning memes. Slapping words on an image and calling it a meme doesn't mean you have permission from the copyright owner to use their work. Is it copy strikeable? Yes, it all is. Now the insanity of this is, isn't that the EU is trying to enforce people to respect others' rights to own content. That would be admirable, but rather it's the fact that they want companies that run user submission based websites to identify whether the things on their website contains copyrighted material, and if so, they need to strike it dead, and if not, they face penalties. So the companies would have to pay in the case that they're not pulling down copy striked material. So basically, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. will all have to implement something akin to YouTube's content ID system, which, as you could imagine, would be a tremendously monumental financial and logistical boondoggle to even get implemented in the first place, and then if they don't do it properly, there's financial consequences on the line. So this isn't made law just yet because it has still another round of votes to go through, but this is an obvious cash grab by the EU to get American companies, or otherwise, to start paying them for content that users submit. Not the users having to pay for it, but the companies. This is unfortunately another case of governments trying to censor the internet for their own gain while trying to disguise it as some sort of benevolent deed. And I'm not particularly clued up on how citizens in the EU can work to prevent this from happening, but if any of you know of the proper steps and methods to take to get heard by these lawmakers, please leave it in the comments below and I'll make sure to pin it. I want us to actually band together to potentially fix this and make sure that this doesn't become law because when crap like this tries to get pulled by the government, I think it's important that we all you know, band together to make sure our voices get heard so that we can retain the freedom that we get to experience in the current state of the internet. So many people have joined in on the bandwagon of trying to stop the FCC with their net neutrality shenanigans, so I think we Americans need to help make sure the EU doesn't get overrun in the same sort of greedy governmental oversight. And I don't typically get political on this show, but when it comes to things like this where it's just at least in my opinion, it's so blatantly obvious. I'm definitely open to having a conversation with you guys if it's not, but this definitely doesn't seem like the government is taking the people's interest at heart and they're just trying to get involved in something they don't really need to be sticking their nose in. So now in news that is also about a government getting a butt ton of money, but in a way that actually benefits consumers, Samsung, Micron, and Hynix can face fines of up to eight 
billion dollars. We reported previously about how lawsuits were possible in the case of DRAM price fixing that's been murdering everyone's wallets for the better part of a year. There has been a class action lawsuit in the works, but this massively financially devastating fine is being led by the Chinese authorities. China's anti-monopoly Bureau of Ministry of Commerce is currently investigating the price fixing allegations since things have still not improved from their last chat with these companies. If found guilty, the fines could be anywhere from $800 million to $8 billion based on the DRAM sales that these companies had during the period that they've been colluding together, if they're found to have been colluding together, which this would not be the first time. So considering a rough estimation of Samsung's operating income for 2018 will be to the tune of around $60 billion, a fine that encompasses 13% of that total income, not profit, their income could actually be a pretty decent deterrent from future issues. Obviously, the fine would be split between the players, but if the Chinese government pursues this to the maximum amount, we could be seeing some real adjustment in the DRAM market. But this isn't the only financial fine issue that Samsung is facing. They've just been hit with a four hundred million dollar fine for violating CPU design patents. A jury in Texas has ordered Samsung to pay that 400 million dollars to the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology after they found that Samsung was using the Institute's FinFET design in their chips. It appears that KAIST approached Samsung with their FinFET design at the initial stages of their research, but Samsung rejected it until Intel had licensed it and started putting it in their CPUs. However, bad boy Samsung decided to have the competitive advantage by not paying for licensing, and then they contracted out to Qualcomm and Global Foundries and had them using the illicitly produced chip design. It appears that the jury has found Qualcomm guilty as well, but is only finding Samsung since they're the biggest turds in this instance. And as much as we can love Samsung, they're in some serious hot water when it comes to paying money to governments. But in positive Samsung news, we discussed yesterday how they announced their 7 nanometer EUV lithography for chip making. But it appears that TSMC, another gigantic chip fabrication company, has announced that they expect to be on the 7 nanometer EUV process in the second half of 2018. TSMC is currently ramping up their 7 nanometer chip production for a whole heck of a lot of 7 nanometer designs that we can expect to see soon, including AMD's Vega, Navi, and Zen 2 CPUs, as well as apparently Apple's new iPhone A12 processor. Other TSMC customers include Bitmain, the makers of the infamous Antminer ASICs, NVIDIA, and Qualcomm. They expect the majority of 7 nanometer orders to be carried out in the first half of 2019, which gives us a pretty good indication that we're not going to see a new AMD launch until next year, like I mentioned in my Computex rumor video right up here. January or February seems to be a good prospective launch window right now for AMD's next-gen cards because of TSMC's production. It seems like they're getting 7 nanometer GPUs to AMD right now for their Radeon Instinct lineup, but again, consumer lineup would probably be with the majority of orders that TSMC is saying is going to go out at the beginning of 2019. And then the fact that they're stating NVIDIA as a customer for the 7 nanometer design could also give some credence to the rumor that was floating around that NVIDIA might skip 12 nanometer Volta based designs for the 1180 altogether in order to prevent AMD from getting a lead in process technology. Or it could be that they'll release 12 nanometer initially in a few months and then release the TI versions of their GPUs on the more advanced 7 nanometer process or this has nothing to do with the consumer level GPUs and this could just be for their replacement for Volta on the, you know, the Quadro and Tesla lineup. Who knows? We don't have enough information yet to draw a conclusion, but I want to hear from you about what you think down in those comments. Sound off. Bam. So TSMC also said that they expect their 5 nanometer technology to be ready in 2020 after an investment of $25 billion is invested in its development. And in case you care about process technology a whole heck of a lot, I'm including a recent article from Semiconductor Engineering about the current issues that companies will face about the transition to 3 nanometer chip design. Apparently Samsung and Global Foundries are trying to develop a new transistor technology called NanoSheet FET that could help overcome some of the challenges that come with shrinking chip design, but it's going to be a long and costly process to get there. Again, link for that will be in the video description for you guys to actually read. And now it's time for today's segment of Your Reality Isn't Good Enough. So Valve has announced that it's shipping the developer kits for their new VR controllers known as Knuckles. 
They're called that because they go on your knuckles instead of your palm. This is coming from the company that named a game about creating portals as Portal, so it just fits. The redesign is supposed to be able to detect your finger movement to allow for a much more immersive virtual reality experience in that you'll be able to actually manipulate and control objects in a much more intuitive and intimate manner. Again, these are just the dev kits that are going out, so we'll have to see how this progresses to know when they might be ready for a consumer release. And then in the exact opposite sense of VR immersion, Microsoft has backtracked on their plans to bring VR to the Xbone X. So a couple of years ago, when everyone was waiting for Project Scorpio, Phil Spencer promised that Xboners would, quote, get the high-end VR that you see happening in the PC space, end quote. But the chief marketing officer for gaming at Microsoft said at E3, quote, we don't have any plans specific to Xbox consoles in virtual reality or mixed reality, end quote. So imagine that. Microsoft lied. Exponers get no VR. PlayStation is still the best non-portable console. The world keeps on spinning. And that ends this segment of your reality isn't good enough. And then in more bad news that I forgot to include at the beginning of hot news, those super expensive and amazing 4K 144Hz HDR G-Sync monitors are actually Kind of crap if you try to use them at their peak specs. So in an incredibly informative Reddit post, user Glenn Wing gives a ton of explanation as to why many users have been complaining about their new super fancy $2,000 monitors. Apparently, DisplayPort 1.4 just doesn't have enough bandwidth to actually do 4K 144Hz HDR content. It can do 4K 120Hz non-HDR and 4K 100Hz HDR, but the combination of 144Hz at HDR at 2160p is an impossibility given the amount of data the cables can actually transfer. So, in order to get them to those specs, the monitors use something known as chroma subsampling, where they render two-thirds of the image at half the horizontal resolution, so effectively 1920 by 2160, in order to save on bandwidth. This subsampling has led to blurry and fuzzy images when users try to get the monitors at their quoted amazing specs. There's apparently another method of compression known as display stream compression, or DSC, that can still reduce bandwidth but give a clearer picture overall compared to chroma subsampling and would just be much better. But because these monitors are G-Sync and G-Sync doesn't support DSC, they're stuck looking crappy when you try to actually use them for what they're supposed to be used for. So because Asus and Acer wanted to rush to get these monitors out, even though they were released a year after they were announced, a year plus, and they used marketing hype to promote them, we now have $2,000 4K 144Hz HDR G-Sync monitors that can't actually do any of those things together. You can only have proper 4K if you want to go 120Hz for normal color depth or 100Hz for 10-bit HDR, or if you want to have the full 144Hz, you can't have true 4K since only one third of the display is being rendered at the proper resolution. And then let's quickly round up the rest of today's news. AMD has changed FreeSync 2 to FreeSync 2 HDR and implemented a few new feature sets, unlike the new G-Sync HDR that NVIDIA is promoting. You can watch a super informative interview with PC Per at the link in the video description. They had a good track with AMD about all of that. And then YouTube has announced a lot of new monetization options for creators at VidCon, including paid channel memberships that resemble Twitch subscriptions, as well as including merchandise through Teespring. Again, full details will be in the description. And then we have a great article as to why Apple still hasn't released their Air Power Charger that would enable wireless charging for the iPhone, Apple Watch, and AirPods all at once. They were supposed to release this month in June, but apparently Apple is now aiming for September. Again, check out the link in the description for more deets because there's a lot of information there. And then lastly, we have rumors about Intel refreshing their Xeon server lineup to use multiple dyes in their CPUs, similar to AMD's Zen-based Epic chips. So apparently, if you can't beat them, you partner with them, hire their GPU guy, fire your chief marketing officer, hire their CPU guy, run bad demos, fire your CEO, and then join them. Again, just a rumor on Intel's potential Cooper Lake Xeon chips, but Intel really seems out of place in today's CPU game. And that wraps it up for today's hot news. Let me know what you thought of any and all of the stories down in the comments. I would love to converse with you all about it. Let's chat down there. Also, don't forget to hit that like button while you're down there to show support for us and get subscribed to stay up to date on all of our tech related content. We don't have subscriptions or memberships on this channel yet, but maybe consider that when they come out, we'll try to figure out a way that we can incentivize that for you guys. Hopefully it'll be worth both of our whiles. Uh, I think that's it, yeah.
I, I'm still super angry at Reese for rickrolling me. I, I, it's not okay. It is not okay. Anyways, I'm Brett with the UFD Tech Channel. Thank you so much for watching today's episode of Hot News, and I will see your smiling faces again later.